Excellent. Um, thank you for the introduction, Kevin. Um, yeah, I'm moving a little bit slow today. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, I couldn't be here yesterday because of that uh, run I was doing. And uh, I figured it worked into my plan. If, if I needed some medical attention after my run, what would be the best place to go? So I told them, like, if my legs give out during the thing, it's not like part of the act. It's because I actually need some help. So, um, but here we're we're here to talk about uh, cave rescue in Western Canada. So we'll talk a little bit uh, about some of the challenges that uh, are involved in in cave rescue. And uh, even if you don't have any sort of desire to go into a cave, perhaps there's something in the presentation that you'll, you'll find you can apply to your work or your environments that you work in. Um, first off, I'll talk a little bit about caving in general. Uh, caving isn't a hugely popular sport to, in Western Canada. There's a couple of different provincial caving organizations that are around, and they have a membership in each province of maybe about 100 to 200 people in each province. So you compare that to, say, the Alpine Club of Canada, where you have maybe 10,000 members. It, it's not a hugely popular thing. Even though in places like British Columbia, where Vancouver Island is kind of like a sponge, it's got so many holes in it that... It's the biggest concentration of, ca of caves in the country there. And there's only about 125 members of the uh, British Columbia Speleological Federation. So not a hugely uh, popular activity, um, but there's a lot of people doing it who are outside of that, those organized uh, groups. And uh, I guess part of, part of the uh, reasoning behind it, perhaps, is if you look at pictures of people climbing or mountaineering and doing stuff, you see cool, cool vistas and different things like that. And uh, think to yourselves, like, would you rather be out in this kind of thing uh, on the mountain, or would you rather be in the mountain? <laughs> Um, it's just, it's not a sexy thing, like, to be covered in mud and, and you know, it's kind of a lot of misery, really, uh, to go caving sometimes. So, I, some of you guys maybe were caving the other day. Did anyone go on a, a trip or is that? Yeah, it, you know, it, it has its moments. Uh, I think uh, there's, there's been times caving where I myself I had to really, you know, kind of think about whether I really like what I'm doing or not. Uh, but, uh, yeah, definitely it, it has its misery. And uh, I guess... Uh, I uh, shouldn't have to kind of pose the question to a group like this about why would you even do, do that kind of thing? Why would you put yourself through misery? Or why would you go out into the mountains? Um, well, there's a lot of reasons why people would go caving outside of just the normal sporting aspects where you go into a cave to see the sights. Uh, you're there to uh, do essentially like a sporting trip. Um, there's quite a few different reasons why people would do it. Uh, one of them is exploration. And it's kind of one of the unique things about caves in that there's a lot of them that are unexplored. And even the caves that are explored have a lot of unexplored areas. So you can go into a cave and uh, be in a place where nobody has been. We can do that right here in Alberta and in British Columbia. There's so many places that you could go. One of the expeditions that I was involved in a couple years ago was in a place called Sistema Huatla, which is in Mexico. We were there for four weeks uh, as part of a seven-week expedition. And that expedition established that cave as the deepest in the Western Hemisphere. So the depth currently sits at about 1,450 meters in depth. So if you're around Calgary, you're around uh, um, the skyline, and you can kind of see the Calgary skyline. That's kind of what it looks like. The largest building in Calgary was the Bow Office Tower. It's 238 meters in height. So next time you're looking up at the Bow Office Tower, imagine what 1,450 meters in depth underground is. Uh, and that's what you're looking at. And in order to get to that depth, there are 90 separate repels or pitches that you must repel down and, in reverse, climb back up on the way out of the cave. Um, so that'll speak a little bit to some of the challenges that could be involved uh, a bit in cave rescue. Um, so here's one of the pitches in that cave. It's called the space drop, and this ends you uh, at the, where the person's standing is the minus 620 meter level. So there's quite a few different drops in the cave that are like this. Uh, and that's one of our kind of staging areas that we used on the expedition. Um, just a really cool place to be. Uh, so we have a lot of that kind of stuff uh, even here in Canada. Our second longest cave system in the country is Yorkshire Pot. And it's right here uh, in the, right on, around the Alberta BC border in the Crow's Nest Pass area. 13 kilometers in length. And it was explored mostly from the 1970s into about the mid 2000s. So in 30 years of exploration, they linked a number of cave entrances in the area all together throughout all that time to create this cave system. 
So that was quite a lot of effort. How many unexplored leads do you think are still there in that cave? Any idea? 125. So we could go there any weekend and go to a place where nobody has ever been before. And that's one of the really cool things about caving is you can get to see things that nobody has ever seen before. These are here in a cave called Raspberry Rising, which is in uh, Rogers Pass. So uh, it's a cave that's been under exploration and a project and a Parks Canada research permit to do so. Uh, mapped five kilometers of cave passage over, over about four years. And these are some of the sites, one of the most beautifully decorated caves in the entire country. <laughs> so uh, the soda straws that we see kind of, I'll, I'll kind of point those out if I can. Yeah, so these things here. So you see kind of the length there, and there's, there's actually me standing. So we have about two meter soda straws. Uh, those things grow at about one centimeter per 100 years. So you can kind of get an idea of, of kind of the, the environment that they're in. Um, it's pretty amazing stuff that you can see. So that's one of the reasons for caving exploration. Uh, another reason is science. We have a lot of uh, push in the scientific community to find new antibiotics. Uh, and part of the reason for that is we know that there's these drug resistant infections cropping up all over the place. And one of the things that, that they found is that there are extremophile bacteria. So these bacteria that are living in these extreme environments, they're devoid of light, devoid of nutrients, devoid of things that we think are building blocks for living uh, organisms. Um, we're finding that in caves, the bacteria that we're finding can have antibiotic properties. So they're looking at places like this to uh, find where the next new antibiotic might be that might uh, fight the next you know, drug resistant staph infection that hospitals and things are dealing with. So some of the uh, provincial caving groups are working with researchers, uh, one of whom is Dr. Ann Cheatham out of Thompson Rivers University uh, to collect cave bacteria and uh, you know, test them against various infections and kind of see what comes of that. Uh, so it's really neat science and it's a really neat thing to be involved in, although I've kind of always had these worries in doing these collections that it might be uh, really good for science, but uh, you know, am I going to be patient zero of the next zombie apocalypse? Uh, you know, I, I suppose as long as I don't lick the cave bacteria, I, I should be okay. <laughs> Uh, so that's one of the one of the unique things. Uh, Kevin mentioned Mount Rainier. This was a really cool project uh, to go to the summit volcanic steam caves of Mount Rainier. So we lived at elevation in the summit crater, which is glaciated. We lived there for about six days in order to map and document the volcanic steam caves. We now believe it to be the largest network of volcanic steam caves in the world. Uh, and it's formed by volcanic gases uh, all in the summit crater. And uh, so we did uh, some work there not only to collect back bacteria and map the cave system, but one of the things that we're looking in for in our collections, we're, we're uh, looking for um, these extremophile bacteria, not for the purpose necessarily for antibiotics, but we're working for uh, the, the principal investigator was uh, Dr. Penelope Boston, and she was recently appointed as NASA's head of astrobiology. Now think about that for a second. Uh, you can be appointed the head of a thing that we don't actually know exists. But I guess if you think that there's alien life out there, we're probably not going to find it first in the form of gray men with, you know, uh, you know weird eyes. It's going to be microbes. And the type of microbes that we find in these type of environments are, are what we figure might be very similar to what we might find on other planets and Mars and, and so forth. So, so some of the collections that we do are for her work to uh, kind of find out what's, what's going on, uh, perhaps in other worlds. So there's a lot of unique reasons to go caving and when there's a rescue or something like that and the internet pipes up as to why would you do something stupid and go in such a stupid place and get yourself in trouble, well, you know, there's a lot of good reasons to, to go and do that sort of thing. And that's the kind of thing that drove, uh-oh, uh I think I pressed the button. The wrong button. Yep. Ah. That's, uh, those are some of the reasons which drove uh, German researcher Johann Westhauser into the Riesending cave system, the deepest cave system in Germany in June of 2014. Some of you maybe heard about this rescue. Did anyone hear about that at the time that it came? So uh, at the time, it, it kind of made news and headlines around the world because it ended up being one of the most expensive and biggest rescue operations that the world has ever seen, uh, much less just Europe. So uh, the costs were tremendous. Of course, there were all kinds of comments about about that as, as what comes uh, when there is a big operation. 
But uh, you know, he was a researcher and a cave explorer who was one of the first people to start mapping that cave system in June of 2014. Uh, and I'm going to fire off some dates at you because you can kind of work on the timeline here and, and see how that might play into our story. So on the 8th of June, on the 8th of June at 1.30 a.m., uh, he experienced a rockfall incident in the cave. So he had some rockfall, hit him on the head. He had head and shoulder, uh, upper body injuries from this rockfall. That's 1.30 a.m. and he was at the minus 1,000 meter depth in the cave system. So at that depth, it would take about 12 hours for one of his com uh, compatriots to get out of the cave system to make an emergency call. So we're, so we're 8th of June, 1.30 a.m., 12 hours just for the guy to kind of get out to be able to make a call. Uh, around 4 p.m., uh, so in the afternoon of, of the 8th is when uh, the preliminary rescue team was able to get into the cave. Uh, and they expected to not hear back about anything about the conditions until the afternoon of the 9th of June. Okay, so that team had to kind of go in and assess things um, first. So by the 10th of June in the morning, they were able to report that uh, the team was able to get to the injured party and that they were doing better. So they were able to move and stand up, uh, which was great because it could help facilitate the rescue. So here's some of the scenes. You've got one of the drops that uh, could have uh, uh, or was in the cave. So there's quite a few different drops. Uh, here's the stretcher being moved uh, through one of the sort of constrictions that they had to and, and one of the Tyrolean traverses that was used uh, to move the stretcher through one of the sections of cave. So here's the, the infographic which kind of shows the cave system a little bit. So they ended up uh, building a number of bivouacs uh, throughout uh, the uh, system that they plan to move the cave or two for, for various nights. Now note that the end of the phone line from the surface is at point one. So that's kind of the end of the sort of technological communication that was available to them at the time. So yeah, we're at minus a thousand meters. Uh, so it's been a, a couple days now before we can even say that the guy's doing well. And then they can start setting up those bivouacs. On the 11th of June, so we're at the 8th of June, now it's on the 11th of June in the uh, PM that doctors, they actually were able to get two doctors down to the injured caver uh, and do some stabilization. And on the 12th of June was when they were able to bring a specialized stretcher in uh, to help with the extrication. Uh, the doctors uh, were, were well prepared uh, given the head injury and the trauma. They actually had a skull drill and were prepared to, to relieve pressure and do these kind of interventions underground uh, if they were necessary. So from the 12th of June uh, and ongoing, they were able to uh, move the caver throughout the various drops. The long straight section was accomplished fairly quickly. By the 15th of June, he was at the uh, point number four, bivouac four, and then became the very long and arduous process to lift him up the various uh, pitches uh, up to get to the entrance. So that was 15th of June on the bivouac four, and it was 19th of June uh, in the middle of the day-ish that, uh, that the, he reached the entrance. So let's think about the timeline here. Anyone had, had the idea of how many days did it take for this whole operation? <laughs> it was 11 days, 10 hours, 14 minutes. So 274 hours uh, before he could be brought just to the entrance, Now, let, get a, let alone being flown to, to a medical facility. So uh, rescuers, there were 202 cave rescuers involved in the underground operation and 522 uh, other rescuers on logistical and other support above ground. So there was over 700 rescuers involved in this operation. So they said uh, just the mountain rescue alone would not be able to cope. They had uh, cave rescuers flown in from all different countries in Europe to help with this extrication. So that's a, a little bit about the uh, cave rescue in Reasoning King, uh, Cave, as can only be explained by a person who wasn't there but has read the reports. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, I actually don't have that detail. Uh, I'm not sure. So sorry, I can't answer. I'll, I will try to find it out, though. Yep. Um, so why do we kind of uh, highlight this as a, as a bit of an issue? Well, and the reason is, is that it can happen here. 
uh, that level and that scale of rescue could very well be a thing that we have to deal with here in Western Canada. And that speaks to some of the challenges with cave rescue, one of which is remoteness. And if you define uh, remoteness as distance from a medical facility, then I think caves have a, <laughs> have a really uh, a big issue for us there. Um, one of the examples in Canada that I could speak to is Castleguard Cave. That's Canada's longest cave. It's in Banff National Park and uh, right now sits at about 21 kilometers of map passage. Although unlike a lot of other caves where it's a very maze-like uh, sort of structure, that uh, 20 kilometers is very linear. So at one point, uh, you could have considered Castleguard Cave. If you were in the furthest reaches, you were further from daylight than anywhere else in the world. Um, so that's since been, been, uh, been uh, you know, circumvented. There's other other caves that are longer, but at one time that was the case, and uh, a rescue from that uh, cave would prove very challenging in that it would take perhaps even two days uh, for a caver to even get to the rescue site. And I mean, there's no helicopter. There's no way to circumvent that. There's no way, physical way, to get there faster, especially when you're hauling a rescue load or rigging kits or other things uh, to that location. And there's expeditions to Castle Guard Cave probably once every two years on average, uh, big expedition pushes. And there's still exploration going on. Like I said about Yorkshire Pot, Castle Guard Cave is still being explored. We've not not, you know, not documented everything that's there. Um, some of you maybe know uh, Greg Horn. Um, he's a parks guy out of out of Jasper National Park. Uh, he's been a caver and a mountaineer. And he, in talking about Castle Guard Cave, he's he said a few things. And one of the things he said about caves and cave rescue is is one of the differences. Uh, between, uh, say, a rescue in a cave versus a rescue on the side of the mountain. It's like the difference between having a rescue in, in your backyard versus the dark side of the moon. It, like, it's a, real, it's a real problem to be so far removed from the rest of the world. Uh, we have other caves that would have challenges as well, and not even because of distance. Uh, this is one here uh, on the left-hand side. That's a waterfall climb uh, that's only about 100 meters into a cave called Raspberry Rising in Rogers Pass. Uh, Raspberry Rising is unique in that uh, uh, 80 meters into the cave is a flooded sump. The flooded sump is you know, where the water reaches the ceiling and you have to use cave diving equipment to get through that section. At the low point of the sump is a 40 centimeter slot that you have to fit through underwater, after which you kind of come up to the other side and get to this waterfall, which you climb 25 meters up through and then access the rest of the cave, which has those great crystals and things that, that are really awesome. Um, but, but, but in order to do that, uh, you're 100 meters into a cave where you can see the Trans-Canada Highway from the entrance and to know that if you had some sort of injury where you were immobile and the cave is just above zero degrees, that uh, you could, you're pretty much almost beyond help to be you know, that remote and yet straight line distance so close to you know, society. Uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, another challenge is the resources. So we talked about having 800 rescuers. How do you deal with that kind of thing where it's going to happen once in a blue moon, but when it happens, you have so much that you need to do. So here's an example uh, here of, this is called the, the waterfall exit of Gargantua Cave. It's a classic caving trip here in the Crow's Nest Pass. You can go there, uh, you can repel six repels on a through trip underground, and then come out this other entrance, uh, pulling your ropes down after you. Uh, it's been the site of a number of rescues, a lot of the reason being that throughout the season, this waterfall, which which is the exit, can freeze over. So if you've pulled your ropes down, you can't go back the way you came. Um, so it has to be checked. And then the other part is, is the publicly available cave maps don't show where the exit is. So after the last repel, a lot of people who, like they're used to this big kind of passageways, the, the exit is actually through this kind of hole. And if you're not really used to that, you're not a caver, you probably don't think that that's the exit. So you don't even try. So we've had groups that just kind of get, they huddle there for 20 hours, not knowing where to go. And until they get called in as overdue, then uh, they come back. So we did a big interprovincial cave rescue exercise there a few years back with over 100 people and 40 different organizations that were involved. It was quite a learning experience, which I'll, I'll speak to you a little bit. So in order to deal with this resource problem, um, we have to create a system which will, 
which will be expandable. So we have uh, in, in Western Canada, the Alberta British Columbia Cave Rescue Service. So uh, through two parallel organizations uh, as volunteer SAR groups in each province, we have formed this sort of rescue group to deal with that. And Okay, I have a broken slide, but that's okay. I'll speak to it. The, uh, the group is, is two different groups, uh, one in each province. In British Columbia, it kind of evolved as part of the caving community. So in the British Columbia Speleological Federation, they decided that we need this capability. So in 1984, they formed as a subcommittee of the caving organization, a rescue group. Um, so it's kind of unique in the way it formed. It's as if the Alpine Club had formed its own rescue squad in order to deal with mountain rescue. Uh, so in the caving community, it evolved that same way. Uh, in 2001, in Alberta, they figured that it would be good to have a, a separate society that will do a similar job on this side of the border. And then uh, since then, we've kind of have an MOU together where we're going to uh, collaborate and cooperate. And, and essentially, the caves don't care what side of the border they're on. And we know that in a big response, we're calling everybody anyways. So it didn't really uh, you know, we don't really need that, that kind of separation. Uh, another thing that we do is hold uh, training. So our kind of centerpiece is a week-long training seminar in Cave Rescue every uh, two years. So there is one coming up uh, in 2016 in July in Gold River in Vancouver Island. It would be a great opportunity to get involved uh, if you're not interested, or, or sorry, not interested, not uh, involved in caving already. That's kind of the boot camp that would that would help you through from start to finish. We also have weekend workshops in Alberta and British Columbia uh, where we'll do rescue response and companion rescue courses. Uh, we have equipment caches uh, around the provinces uh, where we have specialized cave rescue equipment and we're able to respond anywhere in Western Canada or other places that are nearby uh, if it's required. So my uh, chart here, which you probably can't see, is kind of showing a uh, cave rescue uh, organizational structure. And uh, so there's you know the usual sort of ICS positions that we would fill. But there are a couple that we are cave specific. In operations, we would split into a surface and underground branch. The underground branch having specialized teams specific to the underground work. Uh, sometimes we'll have to have a conservation advisor so that we don't wreck all the pretty crystals in the in the rescue operation. Uh, things like an entrance control position are very important as well in order to establish that um, which teams are, are underground and where people are. So we have a cave rescue list. Our membership is about 200, about 100 in each province. And those are people who have gone through the cave rescue response training. But in an expanding incident and knowing that people may not be available uh, for, for whatever reason, we can't rely on all 200 to come. So we have the Alberta Speleological Society, the BC Speleological Federation. Uh, in the community, the organized caving community, it's kind of an accepted thing that, uh, that uh, the, the cavers are s somewhat responsible for our own, our own uh, futures. And uh, the people who are part of those organizations are... are can be called upon as spontaneous volunteers to come out and help with a big operation. We could also rely on the local ground SAR teams to handle a lot of that surface and logistical support. Uh, we have the National Cave Rescue Commission of the US, which is a training organization. Uh, they're not a rescue team on their own, but they will help in locating those rescue teams to come from, from the United States. As we saw in Europe and other places, that there may well be people coming from, from other parts of the world. Uh, I'm not here really to talk about cave diving per se, but there is a group in Florida that will come and help with rescue and recovery for cave diving incidents, and that is their specialty. They will fly around and do that, and work within that organization's incident command system. So I talked a little bit about some of the training that we do. One of the things that we try to do is called preventative SAR, uh, where we will give people training, a weekend workshop on companion rescue skills. So we talk about risk management. We talk about um, sheltering in place, because we know that if you are injured in a cave and you're not ambulatory, then hypothermia is going to be an issue, and you need to be able to survive until the rescue team can come. So we talk about ways to shelter in place, ways to stay warm, and so forth. Then for the people who are ambulatory and perhaps can self-extricate, we teach skills to do that with the gear that the caver will typically have on their person or should carry on, on a typical caving trip. So we'll cover vertical uh, pick-off techniques, and we'll cover very simple uh, haul system and counterbalance uh, counterweight systems that can help uh, extricate people to an entrance or perhaps to a better location to shelter in place. 
Uh, the organized rescue training, will shelter, well, that's where we introduce our stretcher movement. So we'll have uh, the cave rescue stretcher, we'll cover the hull systems, the counterweight systems, and Tyrolean traverses, which might be used to move uh, the stretcher through the cave environment. Uh, we do the, some of that training outdoors as well, on cliffs and, and in local caves. So again, we have a, like an eight-day seminar and weekend workshops, uh, which are upcoming. So if anyone is interested, uh, those sort of resources are available, and perhaps you'd like to come. So we have specialized equipment that we have to use underground, uh, specific to the cave. So there's specific descenders for caving. There's ascenders. There's uh, specific rescue equipment. And one of the things that we've done recently is kind of diverge from the JIBC sort of surface rope rescue models and adopting more of the European cave rescue techniques. And these are more lightweight rescue techniques. They're using things like cammed and toothed descenders as part of their haul systems under certain conditions uh, and other things that you probably we wouldn't normally see uh, around here. But that's part, part of the reason for that is that cavers in uh, Western Canada are adopting European styles of cave rigging, which are more lightweight as well. So it kind of fits with the cave rigging that's uh, in existence nowadays. So one of the things that we have we're really proud of is this cave rescue stretcher. It's called the Nest. It's made by Petzl. And I uh, brought one in here so you guys can come and have a look at it uh, once, uh, you know, in a break or something. But uh, it's designed for confined spaces. It's kind of a neat... Uh, neat uh, system. I say it's so simple even a caver can use it. Um, so color-coded straps, uh, it's got an integral harness and it's got a couple of these hard points, two hard points that are specifically designed for the rescue techniques that we use in caves. So it's a great tool uh, but uh, we, we've just started kind of buying a few of these. Uh, as I said uh, during the, we had a recent rescue at uh, Rat's Nest Cave, maybe you guys saw a bit on the news uh, about that. Uh, at one point, it came time to feed the team because you know people were getting hungry, and uh, there was a nice lady from from Alberta Parks Conservation that was running the incident command post, and she said, "Hey, uh, you know we're going to need to start feeding people. Uh, do you guys have like uh, you know a budget for you know can we get some food and stuff like that?" And I'm like, "Lady." Our budget is in the hundreds of dollars a year. <laughs> but I think we can manage. I think we can manage. So these things are about two to three thousand dollars each. So it's a bit of a struggle for us uh, to, to kind of outfit all of our rescue caches with them. But through time and kind donations, we are building up to that. So we do have a couple in the province here, one on Vancouver Island, but uh, the other caches are still, uh, we're still looking for those. Kind of actually a unique application, a unique application. We took it to Jasper National Park with uh, the visitor safety guys up there for a couple rescue exercises, and the park itself actually bought one. Uh, and they thought it would be a neat thing that perhaps could be applied to other confined spaces, such as crevasses or different things like that. So it's kind of a kind of a unique thing um, that uh, you know perhaps we'll see a wider benefit than just caves. So uh, here's an example of Tyrolean Traverse, and here's a tooth descender being used as part of a progress capture system um, that, uh, that's part of the European style of cave rescue techniques. So we've talked a bit about some of the challenges. We talked about resources. We talked about um, the remoteness of caves. Another challenge that we have is communications. So you've kind of got to think about uh, the way that you might rely on communications in the surface uh, will not apply underground. So the traditional radios that you will use uh, aren't going to work. So uh, radios being a line of sight device, we can expect them to maybe work around one corner in the cave. So you need either a lot of radios or you need to rely on manual methods or we have what we call is the cave radio. So here's an example of the, the cave radio uh, in use underground. Uh, it's not a kind of thing that you can go to the Motorola store and say, I'd like five cave radios, please. Uh, it's just not a thing that, that exists. The, the cave radio is a labor of love built by caver electronics geeks. Um, and the, the five that we have in service, two in, our, uh, two in BC and, and three in Alberta, are made by a guy that just makes them. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So his name's Ian Drummond, and, and he's made these cave radios. And it's an ultra low frequency frequency radio. Um, it's pa like the the radio part is just a normal CB radio, but he has a thing that he calls a transverter, which somehow integrates into the thing and connects to the the antenna. The antenna, like this, is a loop antenna. I'm pretty sure this yellow cord is an extension cord from Home Depot. Um, that's that's part of the system. So anyways, we have that as a, as a communication device. And, and here's an example of how it compares to, say, a regular radio system. The cave radio wavelength is 185 kilohertz compared to your cell phone G GRS and a 1.6 kilometer wavelength. So you can see how that uh, wavelength compares. But it allows the cave radio to transmit through hundreds of meters of limestone underground, which is a really unique kind of thing to have. So um, it's, it's one of those things that can help uh, make or break your rescue. Because if you've maybe heard the expression, the first thing to break down in any marriage or rescue is communication. Right. So we, we find that. Uh, we find that uh, once you get to the cave entrance, it's like the wormhole to the gramma quadrant. Uh, there's just like there's there's no comms, uh, and we kind of have to deal with that. So you end up having to you know employ the one of the two cave radios that are in existence uh, to do that. Uh, hopefully it will work. Your distance and your antennas are okay, uh, or you're relying on runners like it's manual people running messages back and forth. And we find that uh, in the initial stages of of the rescue or of any of our exercises that we've done, we tend to have this sort of communications breakdown and uh, it, it, I mean maybe it's happening on the surface too but but when we when we send cavers in and they're very mission oriented their their goal is to get the guy to the thing right get the stretcher to the surface that's their goal and if if there's rigging or other things that need to be done then communication seems to be kind of lower on the list um, so we find that we have this sort of breakdown um, but things can still work and what I've kind of thought about now while, while I was preparing for the presentation I was thinking a little bit about this and how why do things still kind of work even when your your traditional ICS structure like there's no direction coming from an incident command post and and all this thing all these things are happening and, and nobody really kind of knows uh, what to do in that three-day cave rescue exercise I mentioned about gargantua cave that we did interprovincial exercise our incident command post in Blairmore for three days had no idea what was going on underground. We sent in the cavers, and, and we sent in the cavers, and for three days they conducted this whole rescue exercise with no direction uh, really whatsoever, other than what they were able to self-organize uh, underground. I don't think any person who had an underground role assigned by the incident command had the same job once they you know, got past the cave entrance. And it was kind of a unique thing to see kind of over time that, you know, even despite our best efforts, you know, until you can set up that proper command and control system, we're always in this sort of black hole communication gap where we, we kind of, maybe it's, we call it, de maybe it's devolving, but maybe it's not. Uh, I thought about this and there's a military term for it called mission command. Has anyone heard of that before? Yeah, so it's kind of that uh, centralized intent, decentralized execution, where all of your, your guys on the ground know what the mission is. They know enough of the context of the mission in order to make decisions themselves that will further that goal. So in the case where somebody's maybe doing one job, but they're a better rigger than somebody else, maybe they're going to get changed and go and be part of a rigging team to get that stretcher out. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay, and maybe we don't need to have as much command and control as we're used to in perhaps other uh, sort of rescues or operations. I was talking to somebody the other day about this presentation and about our challenges with that, and uh, and uh, you know she's a, a very experienced. Um, rescuer in, in other things than caves and she said ah oh, oh communications yeah well it sounds like at least you guys have an excuse for it so maybe that's a thing that you guys deal with as well so 
So there's new technology, which we can't quite afford yet, but maybe one day we will. Uh, they have the Cave Link, uh, which is an SMS uh, text messaging system, which will transmit through the ultra low frequency wavelengths. Uh, this is called the Nikola radio. It's what we used in Mexico. We were never able to use the Nikola radio to get from the surface to the Camp 3, which is where our main area was underground, but it was able to transmit laterally through two underwater sumps uh, and, and over a kilometer distance away underground. So we at least had some communication with that. So it was kind of neat, neat to have. So we talked a bit about uh, communications as a challenge. Let's t talk a bit about uh, some of the other challenges which are more sort of medical related. I guess this is the right audience for that, I, I think. Um, so they've done a little bit of research on caver injuries and through different polls and studies uh, in uh, the USA, they've uh, found that 37% uh, of people in this poll that they did had sustained one or more injuries while caving. And we know this just because the cave environment tends to be four degrees in the alpine caves around here. In some caves, maybe it's a little bit above zero. On Vancouver Island, perhaps about eight degrees. So hypothermia, we know, is all always going to be one of those considerations. It may not be the cause of the rescue itself, but in the time it takes the rescuers to get there and all those things, and for the rescue team, it's going to be a definite consideration. So hypothermia, most frequent uh, fractures, animal bites, and concussions were the next injuries that people reported. Rate of injury of one per 1,990 hours in a cave. I don't know how does that compare to some of our other sports, uh, you know, avalanches and other things. Does anyone know? So that would be interesting to find out uh, if there's any sort of comparison to that. But uh, they found uh, females were being injured twice uh, the rate of males, and older persons or those with more experience seemed to have lower injury rates. And from that study, they were able to gather that uh, proper techniques, safe climbing should be part of training, and that even on short ascents and those sort of scrambly ascents and things, those are, are uh, where perhaps a proper belay where you know, people think they can do it, perhaps a belay would be best advised in some of those cases because it's some of those short drops where people are just losing control and having short falls, which cause injury. Yes, question? Yeah. Bats? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bats. Typically. No, not, not much else. Well, I mean, there are some pretty cool cave life things that exist. Uh, uh, <laughs> No, yeah, and like, I, I don't know, and here's, okay, I'll give you one example. Uh, so at the bottom of Sistema Huatla, there is a scorpion that lives there. It's a translucent, uh, pigmentless, eyeless scorpion that exists uh, in the water at the bottom of Sistema Huatla. Uh, and I don't think anyone's been stung by it. It's the only place it exists in the world, so it hasn't been heavily researched, but the science people who were interested in it when we were on our expedition, I guess there's kind of like two theories, is that the scorpion has very low venom because it doesn't need much to kill and hunt other things down there. The other theory was is it's highly venomous because <laughs> there's not much to hunt and kill, so whatever it stings, it has to be sure that it's dead. <laughs> Nobody, I think, wants to volunteer to be the subject of that sort of medical study, and I don't know how they would study the you know, venom level of this thing, but yeah, I, there are other life forms, perhaps. Uh, I'd say bats are probably the one. Uh, you know, sometimes there are other animals that can exist, uh, not cave, not, they don't live permanently in caves, but we know that, you know, there's other wildlife that will live in cave entrances and things, so, so we can see that. Uh, helmet use should be stressed. Uh, I think on every caving trip I've ever had, no matter how simple, I have hit my head on the ceiling hard enough that I would have knocked myself unconscious. Um, and it's just that situational spatial awareness that you're not used to having that overhead environment. It's so easy to just, just do that. So that was one study on caver uh, injuries. There's been other uh, studies that have been done specific to rescue. And uh, like uh, what the American Alpine Club and different uh, mountaineering organizations have with uh, studies and, and books on mountaineering accidents, the US National Speleological Society puts out a publication called American Caving Accidents. Uh, and that's where they compile incident reports about caving related accidents in North America. So over the years, they did a study and found there were, so. Um, 
877 different incidents over the time span of the, the most recent study, and 1,356 cavers requiring rescue. So that equates to about 50 cave rescues a year across North America. So it's not a very high output activity. And most of those are not those big, huge rescue operations that, that we see like the one in Germany. But we do see uh, from that uh, uh, a lot of data that we can, can use to help guide our, our medical people. So uh, cave or fall, that is the, the highest mechanism of incident, and they split cave or fall into these different categories. Mechanical fall basically means it's human error. So somebody didn't use their equipment properly, uh, they made some kind of mistake which, which caused the fall. The other types are the equipment failure, so that's their personal equipment, or an anchor failure, so some sort of failure of their, their rigging, their integrity of the rock uh, that they were bolted to. Um, so those would be the majority of the mechanisms of, of uh, incident. Loss of cave integrity, so rock fall, 6% of them were rock fall incidents, so that's going to be one of our next highest. Is uh, We're in caves all the time where we have what we call a breakdown chamber, and that is essentially, it could be a room this size where it's just made of boulders, big, it could be car-sized boulders, and you can tell where they came from the ceiling, <laughs> right? And over thousands of years is when all that breakdown happened. So it's not likely to happen on your trip, but it could. Uh, so we do get those. We get entrapment, a very small percentage of where cavers are actually trapped uh, by the loss of cave integrity or buried by sediments um, uh, by the loss of cave integrity. Okay, unable to exit cave uh, has required rescue. So sometimes people just being stranded or lost, uh, and then perhaps hypothermia kicks in, or perhaps they just needed some assistance to get where they were going. Uh, flooding underground can be an issue. We had a recent incident in December in Vancouver Island. Uh, and it, uh, recently, like as in just a few days ago, the Vancouver Sun had kind of the front page story about these guys and their trip in Cascade Cave and Vancouver Island. So if you look for that online, you can read about their, their experience. But a pocket rocket stove underground probably saved their lives um, because they were going hypothermic. There was heavy rain on the surface. And when they went in the cave, things were fine. On their way out, their exit was blocked by water and they could not exit and were stuck for about 22 hours soaking wet in you know, eight degrees uh, environment. So they were very lucky to be able to get out. Light failure, that's another one, and it's why cavers will carry three sources of light on any cave trip, uh, and preferably two of them being helmet mounted so that if you're rappelling in a waterfall and one of them dies, then the other one's immediately accessible for you to turn on. Stuck and wedged in rock. So that's the recent one that we had here uh, in Alberta, if you've uh, uh, heard about the news a few weeks back in Rat's Nest Cave. Um, so that is one that happens, again, very infrequently that a person is actually wedged in rock, but it does happen. Exhaustion, equipment problems being other mechanisms. The cave environment, uh, hypothermia, uh, again, on its own, not usually a cause for rescue, but uh, can be incidental and can occur throughout the operation. We have medical illness during caving, so there are times where people will have cardiac emergencies or other things, uh, diabetics and, and things like that. Poisoning by toxic gas. So is anyone here a confined space person? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a thing that a lot of people ask me about when, when they talk about caving, is like, oh, is there ever issues with confined space and those sort of things? And I'm gonna tell you, the usual answer is no. Actually, in Canada, we have very little, if any, places where that's been an issue. Um, but there are caves where it is, and in the summit caves of Mount Rainier, which are formed by volcanic gases, that is an issue. So it, it, uh, there are definitely places where it can happen. Uh, animal attacks, illness acquired by caving, so there's things like you know, histoplasmosis or other things that, that can happen. Injured while rescuing, harness hang syndrome, uh, which some of you are probably familiar with, very low incidence, cannot categorize 1%, and I had to look into that. Well, there's so many categories. What does a cannot categorize? And, and one of the examples that was given was uh, intoxicated people going caving. So don't, don't cave while drunk, I guess, is the... The 
So there are sometimes fatalities, and the causes of those, uh, again, cave or fall being that big mechanism of incident that uh, we saw as number one. Drowning. Now, I wasn't here to talk about cave diving. The drowning that we're talking about in this study is things like, uh, we call them ducks. So ducks are where there's a flooded section of cave passage that you can go through by holding your breath, and you just kind of duck under. And sometimes people will get stuck in a duck, or perhaps the duck is longer than you thought it would be, and that has happened. Uh, becoming physical jammed and cardiac disease, so those are some of the, f the fatalities, and perhaps you guys can tell me, but the study had said that that's consistent with other types of injuries you might see in the wilderness. Uh, fractures being the most common uh, type of injury, uh, we're seeing 48% uh, of spine and back injuries being fractures, 48% lower extremity, 56% of pelvis and genitalia injuries. Uh, so lower extremity being medically important because that's where we're going to have to bring the stretcher in and, and go through this whole process of the stretcher evacuation. And the rule of thumb is for every one hour travel into a cave is about one day out on a stretcher. So you know, we kind of keep that sort of time frame in mind. So where we have upper extremity injuries, um, that's also a large number, but in those situations, that's where some of those self-rescue techniques have been come into play, and there hasn't been a huge rescue response. So uh, the discussion that came out of that research was that uh, the rescue providers should be prepared with the knowledge and supplies to splint and bandage uh, the injured victim, uh, and should be prepared for somebody requiring that full extrication. Uh, so even in this rat's nest uh, rescue where we had the stuck cave we had the cave rig for a stretcher rescue because we, you know, we weren't sure whether the guy could make it out on his own power or not, and we had to be prepared for that. Um, now, we just learned a whole by a bunch about uh, C-spine, so maybe, maybe we'll have to rethink the last bullet point here, but it says rescuers should be able to perform spinal immobilization. So some resources that are available to you. If you'd like to read up more about caving, if you'd like to sign up for cave rescue training, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter or check out the Can Caver website. It's a great resource on all the different caving organizations, the longest caves, the deepest caves, a lot of information there. All right, are there any questions? That's kind of the end of my, that's the end of my talk. So I, I hope you guys... Thank you.